<clears throat> Let me begin with a brief introduction about the human universe. And then I'll follow that by some comments on a few slides I prepared for this talk, then conclude with some ideas for um, in the context of multiculturalism versus interculturalism, the topic of the talk, uh, perhaps applicable to innovating education. There are five points I want to make about the character of the social universe. Whereas the natural world is regulated by physical laws, living organisms by biological laws, the human universe, by comparison, is chaotic. And it needs the human mind in its evolved creative capacity, uh, qualitatively unique in the animal world, to impose order on this chaos. It does so by integrating elements, domains, spaces, and it puts them together into a unified, coherent sociocultural universe, which is then transmitted by cultural means in society. Now, cultural means can be formal education, but it's also storytelling, family socialization, or a combination of all of them. All of these are how cultures um, and uh, knowledge is transmitted. This is carried over across generations for millennia. As an example, ancient Egyptians imposed order creatively and dynamically by turning elements from the natural world, the social world, the cultural worlds, and built a coherent vision integrating life, death, gender, the animal world, the idea of deity, the cosmos, family, earth, which is, by the way, in ancient Egypt is male, not female, you know, mother earth type thing. It's the earth is male, and the sky is female, governance, justice, morality, and much more. So let me show you a, a slide here, I've shown that before, but not in, um, to this audience. Uh, here we have this beautiful goddess, Matt. She represents stability. And the, if it's not Matt, the opposite of Matt would be Isfet, who represents chaos, meaning evil, violence, injustice. And if you look at Matt, we have, she has the feather, the ankh, life, and the scepter, governance. And in order for the Egyptians to give order to their universe, they put a balance among all of these. You cannot have governance without justice, and you cannot have justice without life, and life is a harmony between nature, culture, gender, cosmos, all together, and uh, the stability comes about from this balance of these universes. So this is used, or has been used, as a guiding worldview. They consider it a worldview to build their uh, societies, but mostly to build the first unified nation state in our civilizational history. And as this audience already knows, quite a remarkable civilization. This is, uh, there are some variants on this worldview, but this was very uh, fundamental. The second point is that each era and every age since our human beginnings experiences new normalities. We are talking about new normalities as if they are new. And that new normalities are always resisted because they challenge people's comfort zones. So we have new changes, they confront the comfort zones of people, and you find resistance. And number three, 
perhaps not obvious, but cultures and societies are always changing. So we, we think that we have to introduce change. Societies are naturally changing all the time, but they are changing at very small paces that can be absorbed by the people. Only when change is forced on society or is imposed upon the people, whether from the inside or the outside, or when it is entered too rapidly, does it lead to dissonance and instability? And there are many societies where change came too fast and destabilization takes place. Number four, to innovate, and here we, of course, are, we are talking about education, we do need insights from wherever we can get them, but definitely we should not leave out the historical past the knowledge, the models, the insights from our historical past. However, looking at our past is not about turning back the clock. It's not a matter of nostalgia. We're not sitting here saying, let's do what the ancient Egyptians did. Things are changing. There are technological advances. There are new challenges. But we should seek insights in models and experiments at every level of human development. So we have models by um, ancient civilizations and we can analyze them and seek ideas and insights, not necessarily copy the model. The fifth point, to build a new paradigm for education, we need to situate innovation within cultural tradition to preserve cultural uniqueness rather than a one-size-fits-all which tends to homogenize and we don't want a homogenized world. The focus, uh, on the other hand, we don't want endless diversity either. We need to identify commonalities and we seek commonality without homogenizing. We respect difference and diversity without compromising uniqueness. The sixth point, rather than a discontinuous, fragmented, dichotomous model of disparate elements, we can bring its parts together in a pattern of dynamic, interactive, interconnectedness to form an integrated whole. So, instead of asking how do we change education so that the people can uh, be trained um, in a way that is compatible with the new technology so that they find jobs, we ought to be reminding ourselves that we as humans invented technology and we invented it the way it is. And we created it for our use. So we should be able, using the same minds, to imaginatively humanize it in such a way as to meet our needs in the emerging global world. Uh, and I'm not referring to uh, after you make a robot, you uh, start uh, looking for this very fashionable word emotion and you put emoticons uh, to the robot to create emotion. That's not what I'm referring to. We humanize technology to meet our needs instead of robotizing humans to fit technology. So now let me connect these insights to multiculturalism and interculturalism. It's presented as if it's a polarity. So I ask myself, is it really a polarity? And in order to seek answers for this, I'll have to journey back a little, all the way to the third century BC in Alexandria, to eighth century Cordoba, to ninth century Baghdad, and to 11th century Cairo. Uh, we have the, you all heard of the great library of Alexandria, the third and second centuries BC, the great library of Cordoba, of the Umayyad dynasty in Andalusia, which was 756 to 1031. The Umayyads were the first Muslim dynasty that was established in Damascus in 661. 
there are many more academies. I just mentioned a few uh, major points. But I want to focus on two of these, Beit al-Hikmah of Baghdad and Dar al-Ilm of Cairo. Uh, Beit al-Hikmah was the early 9th century. Dar al-Ilm was, much, was later 1005 CE. I like this quote. There are many um, uh, comments made by scholars about these early um, academies. But I like that uh, particular small piece of a quote. Shelves, and this is referring to Dar al-Ilm of Cairo, shelves in 40 cabinets each could accommodate about 18,000 books, et cetera, et cetera. It gives you a sense of what it looked like. This is a depiction of Dar al-Ilm, or the House of Knowledge, at 1005 um, in Cairo. This is a depiction, but it gives you a sense of all these scholars in one place. And they are scholars from all fields and of all uh, the uh, nationalities of the region at the time, which is from the Arabs, from Central Asia, India, Persia, and so on. And there were men and women. Uh, as long as they are scholars and have curiosity and are interested, they would be in this place. And of course, there was the wisdom of the leadership at the time that was accumulating the information and the knowledge and made it accessible to scholars so that they sit and think and invent and um, exchange ideas. Uh, dar means house in a large sense, house uh, in many households. Al ilm in Arabic could be science or could be knowledge. It's a combined idea, science and knowledge. Beit al-Hikmah, Beit is house, but in a smaller sense, Beit al-Hikmah of Baghdad, house of wisdom, early 9th centuries, earlier, and it's my favorite. Um, Beit means house, al-Hikmah means wisdom, but it also could be science and scholarship and knowledge. The depiction uh, to the left is, uh, again, a scholar sitting with a library behind them sort of gives you an idea of what it looked like, and some are reading and some are discussing. And um, the uh, um, picture to, to my right um, is, um, I think it's a cover of a book called 1001 Nights, but it's uh, Inventions. And it's uh, still, it, it gives a good sense of what it was like, people standing around and sitting and reading and translating. They were translating Greek knowledge, but they were inventing and creating. There was an observatory there, and there was science, and there was discovery, and was invention, and publication, and printing. All this, all this knowledge came to us. This was during the uh, golden age of Islam, which was the dark ages of Europe. Once uh, Europe came out of its dark ages and started building its uh, industrial revolution, they already had that knowledge to build on. So to go to multiculturalism and interculturalism, um, I look at elements that are common in all these class academies. They are gathering places of both teaching and learning. You can't really distinguish. They sit and teach each other, but also are learning. Uh, there is knowledge exchange. There is research sharing. There is translation, because they felt that it's important to build knowledge. And if there is knowledge existing before the knowledge that they are discovering, it should be translated and should be acquired. The common language at the time was Arabic. So all these people coming from different parts of the world were dealing with knowledge in Arabic. There was printing, reading, documentation. Uh, academy and university is combined. Library and archive is combined. Curious scholars across ethnicities and faiths, Muslims, Christians, Jews, 
and others were all sitting together there discussing uh, knowledge. Uh, many cultural traditions, but what brought them together was this knowledge. Uh, the observatory, of course, was put in there in that uh, academy for discovery and invention, so you can imagine some scholar going up and watching the stars and coming up with an idea and coming back to his colleagues who are from a very different field and they're all exchanging that. But there was also music and art and poetry and philosophy. It wasn't just pure uh, science. Uh, as I said, Arabs, Persians, Indians, Slavs, Muslims, Christians, Jews, all faiths, all sects were together. Teaching and learning was integrated with research and discovery, innovation, and recording, that is archiving. So, when I look at multiculturalism, I look at very different shaped objects uh, together in form. But when I look at interculturalism, where we have uh, exchange, integration, we not only get a very powerful aesthetic here, but there is an inner structure to that kind of Islamic art. There is a logic behind it. So interculturalism and the exchange of knowledge the, brings about a new form, a new idea, a pattern of interrelatedness and a beautiful form. Whereas multiculturalism, it exists um, altogether, different shapes, but nothing will happen until the form turns into a process, until the quantity becomes quality, until the sum of parts, which is static, becomes interactive energy and dynamic pattern. So, um, the multiculturalism with many ethnicities, culture, traditions, faiths, and fields sounds like a good idea, but is it enough? And is it part of a polarity, or do we have to see both together? The exchange, the sharing, and the building of knowledge. So if we translate uh, some of these ideas to um, innovation in education, I would think that we have to follow two pursuits. We have to build minds, not just train for skills. And I think this was said over and over in some, um, not directly train for skills, but build minds as well. Um, knowledge creation, we have to combine the library with the research institutes. I think we lost that in the new architecture of universities where you have to walk several miles to the library and then sign in and sign out and things like that. It ha research has to be integrated with the library work so that, you know, we do labs in the library, for instance. Uh, students have to have access to uh, research uh, and uh, the existing knowledge to read. Uh, sharing and transmitting of knowledge teaching in the library. Some people now, uh, some um, teachers in the United States are experimenting with taking the students to the library and holding their classes there so that they will have access to the books and take the books down from the shelves and use them. So the two paths need to be integrated, the skills for the market plus the building of the mind. We cannot leave out the building of the mind. So uh, education and innovation must be grounded in cultural tradition. It must be informed by the nation's level of development, demographic, population size, values, identity. We forget that. We have some good models of education, but if we take them as they are and try to apply them to a different situation, it might not work. I would say it won't work. Even the Finnish example, where we say Finland has the best education system, if I take it to Egypt today, it will fail. Different people, 
different size population, we're taking 100 million as opposed to how many in Finland. And then uh, a homogeneous uh, society as a very complex society. So we have to identify the elements, build different uh, templates, and perhaps have templates for this kind of society, another template for this kind of society, but all of them uh, having the integration of elements in it. So, to repeat and conclude, we need to humanize technology because we have the mind to do it. Uh, once technology is there and we are very impressed by all that's happened, we make it happen. It's humans who are sitting in the lab discovering rainbows and the rainbow technology. So if we have that mind, why aren't we using it to humanize technology, and I mean seriously humanized technology, not to put uh, smileys, uh, humanized technology in the sense of make it serve our needs. And hard science does serve our needs. We cannot say, no, we have to go and borrow a term from here, a term from there, and get a, a mix that is diluted. All of these fields are part of our future, and we need it for our universe, but we need to humanize it. We cannot become robotized human, which is beginning to happen even when you are not using a machine. Some people at the, in a grocery store talk like they are robots already. They repeat words, thank you, yes, they don't really mean it, and so on, we are becoming robotized. We have to avoid that, and we can only do it with our human mind. Thank you.